This moment has finally come. What's going on, guys? I'm Tyler, and I'm here to let you know that Dune Part 1 is no perfect movie, but it comes pretty damn close. Dune Part 1 takes place thousands of years in the future. It follows Paul Atreides, played by Timothy Chalamet, as his family is chosen to rule the desert planet of Arrakis because it has the most valuable substance in the galaxy, spice. It extends human life, grants psychic powers, and makes space travel possible. So, because of its worth, naturally, the original rulers of the planet, the Harkonnens, led by Stellan Skarsgård, start planning a war to take the planet back. And Paul has to venture out into the desert to form an alliance with Arrakis's native population, the Fremen, in order to maintain what they have. So, Denis Villeneuve, Timothy Chalamet, Oscar Isaac, Rebecca Ferguson, Zendaya, Dave Bautista, Stellan Skarsgård, Javier Bardem, Jason Momoa, Josh Brolin... Hans Zimmer, among many other talented individuals, you don't have to ask me once if I was excited to see this movie. It was so anticipated that I closed my eyes during the trailers and just listened, let my imagination decide for itself, and, um... Fucking hell, this was such an amazing experience. This was one of the most visually stunning blockbusters I've ever seen, let alone one of the most stunning movies I've ever seen. Just when you thought that Arrival and Blade Runner 2049 were as large-scale as Denis Villeneuve can get, he really has done himself with the overall scope of what you can do with a film, to the point where so many reviewers have compared this movie to Lawrence of Arabia in regards to the size, and for damn good reason. Greg Frazier's cinematography was so Oscar-worthy that, honestly... I lost count at how many gorgeous ultra-wide shots there were that equally portray an environment, a tone, and a population all at once to give you the exact amount of information that you need visually first and dialogue second. And each of these shots was candy to the eyes with the fact that so many of them portray the humans as tiny defenseless ants in comparison to this large, unpredictably dangerous planet that they live on where the scenes are, for the most part, filmed on real-life sets and locations in Abu Dhabi, Norway, Jordan, to portray this larger-than-life galaxy that the characters live in, filled with a virtually unrecognizable amount of practical effects mixed in with digital moments. Even when there are times where you know something has to be CGI, like a vehicle or a space station, because there really is no other way, each shot feels tangible. It feels real because of the textures are well rendered out to make it look like they're actually in the environment. It's not a Marvel movie where you can tell that the humans in it are real, but the backgrounds and the CGI monsters they're fighting are completely fake. Every scene in this movie felt consistent. It felt real. There was not a single shot where I looked at it and said, that looked fake. And how often can you really say that in a movie ever? There were so many subtle visual clues, too, as to which characters are part of certain societies, what side they're on in regards to good versus evil, and what they're capable of through the incredible and also Oscar-worthy costume and set design. When you see a character that has blue eyes, you instantly know that they're Fremen compared to the Harkonnens who are tall, bald, and have absolutely no eyebrows in order to make them look absolutely intimidating. The equally powerful but menacing Bene Gesserit, this all-women sisterhood, you can instantly recognize who they are through these black veils that give them such an ominous presence. And one of my favorite groups that we don't get a ton of information on, but honestly, we don't really need to, are these group of mercenaries that have the ability to levitate. And for a while, I'm just sitting there going, how is this even possible? And then... Once you see a certain character have this spinal cord that's sticking out that's metallic, and you see them levitate in an instant, you know exactly where these soldiers get their powers from. The amount of world building that's communicated in this movie felt genuinely lived in. And it's definitely elevated by Hans Zimmer's score, which I gotta say, this might actually be my favorite musical score he has ever done, and that's really saying something. The combination of... The instrumentals, some of which feature instruments that he had to invent during the lockdown in order to make it sound distinct from his original work, and combining background vocals from a singer known as Lawar Cutler. 
I don't know how to pronounce her last name, but she has absolutely one hell of a voice. The instrumentals, the vocals, they give the movie this grand, large-scale operatic feel that adds so much intensity to the movie, especially when introducing vital characters or during a battle sequence. And the battle sequences were jaw-dropping. They had me smiling. They had me pumping my fists for joy because they were filmed in steady wide shots, no shaky cam. Rarely ever did they do any quick cutting. You can tell that for the most part, these are the actors doing their own stunts, these exhilarating, exciting fight choreography, even when once in a while the editing can be a little choppy, especially during the last fight that doesn't feel anything like the action scenes beforehand. I'm not entirely sure what the case was there, but in any case, it was still jaw-dropping and mind-blowing. And the performances were so top-notch that for the most part, you don't really care that they're barely in the movie all that much. A lot of people are complaining about Zendaya having a limited presence, and yeah, putting her on this poster was definitely a cheap marketing scheme, but at the same time, Dave Bautista, Javier Bardem, even Stellan Skarsgård as the villain, they also feel like they're in the movie just as much as she is, and you kind of wonder why nobody's calling that part out too. But regardless... Timothy Chalamet was the one performance I was worried about the most because this movie rides on his shoulders. And if you've seen every poster or every trailer like this one, you can tell that he gives a lot of blank, emotionless stares that had me worried that he was going to be even drier than Kyle MacLachlan was in the original. And unfortunately, there are moments where he should be wide-eyed and shell-shocked as opposed to just going and not much else, but at the same time, he's also a character struggling with so much new information that he has to process in a limited amount of time, and the only reason he doesn't confide in that many people, because he does have a few trusted advisors, is that he's not sure if they can help him because of their lack of knowledge with this particular scenario, or he's convinced that they wouldn't want to help him because nearly every single character in his life wants him to live by their own predetermined set of morals and ideals, and through his body language, Chalamet does a great job at subtly conveying all of the conflicting emotions that come with deciding whether or not to follow their guidelines or to try and gain his independence. And he learns very quickly that in order to gain his independence and live the life that he wants for himself, he has to sacrifice a lot of things and people that he loved in his previous life, and accept the fact that even though settling disputes peacefully is the first and right way of doing things, there are going to be moments where it won't work, and you're going to be, and you're going to have to rely on other people and ask others who normally would associate as your enemies in order to band together, in order to find common ground, which is such an uplifting message for a movie like this, a message that you don't really get that often in movies anymore. Not entirely sure why, but it's disappointing. And there are so many characters who follow through with those messages. Oscar Isaac as Duke Leto was easy to root for because he's one of the few characters who consistently wants the best for all of his citizens, including and especially his enemies, to the point where he's willing to give up an entire harvest of spice for his workers' safety, because without them, he knows good and hell well that there's nobody else to uh, help him out with that. And his pacifist ideals and attitude make it really easy to understand where Chalamet gets his own morals from. Josh Brolin surprised me a fair bit in that I thought that his gruff, no-nonsense personality in regards to the Atreides, who are much more elegant, was going to make him the relatable one, especially when he has this unla unwavering loyalty to them. But all those qualities that I just mentioned actually make him come across as arrogant and even a little bit bigoted when he's forming his duties as a bodyguard and swordsmaster. But at the same time, you still root for him because when he is Paul's mentor, he does give some valuable advice about how to face one's enemies, and based on his overall intelligence, you know he can and hopefully will become a better person. But the relatable and badass one for sure, without question, was Jason Momoa. I had a blast watching him, and even though the name Duncan Idaho has got to be one of dumbest sci-fi names I've ever heard in my life. He had the best action scenes, he had the best comedic moments because they fit appropriately within the context of each scene, 
his chemistry as mentor and best friend to Chalamet was genuinely wholesome, but also had a lot of mature lessons that come with accepting the things that you can or can't predict in life. But make absolutely no mistake when I say this, the scene stealer of this film, without question, is Rebecca Ferguson as Lady Jessica. She was amazing. She was probably the most complex character within this entire film, because she has to serve opposing sides of a dispute as loyally as possible, even when they're at each other's throats, because this war, regardless of how it ends, is going to affect her son's life. And she is a little bit of an over... She's probably the overprotective parent of the two, in that she trains Paul in so many abilities I don't want to spoil that he's not supposed to have, because, long story short, um, his birth brought a lot of shame to her from the Bene Gesserit, and he definitely needs to protect himself one way or another, even without swordplay, but... She and the Jesuit still have their own convoluted plans for what they want for his future, and that actually puts her at odds with him because his future should be his decision, and based on what they have in store for him, he's always going to have a target on his back regardless. Wow, I'm, uh... I'm getting more worked up about this review than I usually do. I, I fucking love this movie, in case it wasn't that obvious. And even though the villains aren't in it that much, and their motives are pretty basic, they're just greedy, selfish bastards, the actors' performances leave such a cold and menacing presence, especially with Stellan Skarsgård as Baron Harkonnen. I heard that he had to spend seven hours in the makeup chair to look like a 500-pound Varus. I was originally going to say he looked like Uncle Fester if he ate Pugsley, but I felt like Varus was... A much easier character to connect to, but the amount of time in the makeup chair for such a short role instantly pays off because he was he was fucking disturbing to watch, especially when he moves around within a scene. I won't spoil what it is, but he has his own certain powers that give the don't judge a book by its cover, but in a fucked up menacing way as well. And Charlotte Rampling as um, the lead Jesuit has this cold hearted unimpressed personality through her expressions and her line delivery, where if she ever has anything nice to say, it's because it'll benefit herself, particularly the first uh, time she meets Paul, and Lady Jessica is not allowed to attend this meeting, and as they're cutting back and forth from Paul being tortured to Jessica waiting outside, Rebecca Ferguson's facial expressions con convey so many conflicting emotions like regret and grief, meanwhile Rampling is giving this blank, monotone stare that just sends chills down your spine the whole way through. So, um, based on everything I just said, are there any problems with this movie? Well, other than the uneven amount of characters, yeah, um, the last third of Dune, even though it was still good on its own, because it takes place mostly in the desert, there are two glaring problems that make it less entertaining than the previous two the previous two elements of the film. The first is that there are only so many times you could film sequences of the desert and make them look as visually appealing as possible without it getting repetitive. The thing that made it intense was this everlasting threat of these giant sandworms that roam the planet. And because of their large scale size, every time they pop up and characters have to run, the cinematography and the effects make everything look all the more intense. So they were still entertaining. So there was that one problem, and the other one is that throughout the entire last half hour, through the camera work, the music, and the performances, there are so many times where you think the scene is about to cut to black and say, to be continued, and then the next scene will start and it'll rinse and repeat all over again. And I get that it's to create this anticipation to see where these characters are going to go and what fate has in store for them. It's just, you can only do that so many times, and... After two or three moments where they did that, I was starting to lose a little bit of patience with the movie, but for, an, for a two and a half hour runtime, I was never bored. I was either smiling or gripping my fists as my body was shaking during the more, during the more intense moments. Dune is one of the best blockbusters I've ever seen in regards to performances, cinematography, direction, writing, special effects, set and costume design, action sequences. This movie has fucking everything and i encourage all of you 
See it in a theater first. Do not wait for it on TV. It won't do you justice. I'm only seeing this movie in IMAX for the amount of times I see it in theaters, which will probably be three or four if I'm lucky. So in all, for all those reasons, I'm going to give Dune Part 1 a 4.5 out of 5. Just go see it. Go see it now. As soon as I'm done editing this video and posting it, I'm going to see it a second time. That's exactly why I'm making this in such a rush. So guys, thank you so much for watching. If you have seen Dune Part 1, let me know in the comments below what you thought of it. I don't have that much else to say other than thanks for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for more reviews, and be sure to like and subscribe. Take care.